So, as I mentioned already a bunch of times, Easter 2023, and I've titled today's message, A Risen King. A Risen King. But before I begin, I want to share a funny, a funny story. So a man and his wife and his cranky mother-in-law, if you're a mother-in-law, don't take this personally. Again, it's just a joke. And his cranky mother-in-law went on vacation to the Holy Land. While they were there, the mother-in-law passed away. The undertaker told them, you can have her shipped home for $5,000, or you can bury her here in the Holy Land for $150. The man thought about it for a while and told the undertaker that he would just have her shipped home. The undertaker asked, why? Why would you spend $5,000 to ship your mother-in-law home when it would be wonderful to be buried here and only spend $150. Check out what the man said. A man died here 2,000 years ago. He was buried here, and three days later, he rose from the dead. I just can't take that chance. Um, thank you again for joining us this morning on this very, very special day. A day in which Christians around the world celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, from the grave. We celebrate it with unspeakable joy because of what His resurrection means, what it meant, and what it accomplished. See, when Jesus rose from the dead, it meant a death was defeated. Death wasn't the final solution. It didn't end a person's life. True life didn't end when he died. Jesus' resurrection also finally accomplished something that mankind has been unsuccessfully been trying to do after Adam and Eve sinned and were kicked out, evicted, out of Eden. See, humanity, because of his resurrection, Jesus' resurrection, humanity could once again come directly to God and be in fellowship with him. <clears throat> the resurrection of Jesus over 2,000 years ago also gives us joy because it proved everything that Jesus claimed to be and that our hope, that our hope in him isn't in vain. In fact, Christianity either stands or falls on the reality of the resurrection. Here's how the Apostle Paul put it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. Some translations say futile. And you're still in your sins. Now, a few verses later in verses 20, 22, he then says this. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of the great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. And that's from the New Living Translation. I liked how that translation put, that, put those verses. Church, Jesus has risen from the dead. The King of kings, the Lord of lords is alive and one day soon he will come back and gather all of those. All of those who truly trust and believe in him. 1 John chapter 3 verse 2 says this, Dear friends, 
We are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. A beautiful thought. What a beautiful image. What a beautiful hope we have to look forward to. So for those of you who have made him your Lord and Savior, the Lord of your life, rejoice. Rejoice because your king is risen and is alive. Rejoice because you're free from the shackles of sin and death. Rejoice because you've been forgiven of all your sins. Rejoice. Now, I also know that there may be some that maybe haven't made that decision and don't really understand or don't yet know the significance of this day. And that's okay. I'm not here to shame you. If this is you, then allow me to share another story that may help put things into perspective. On an Easter service, a pastor brought an old beat-up rusty birdcage and sat it next to the pulpit. As he gave his sermon that Easter morning, he held up the cage and said, you might be wondering why this is here. As a matter of fact, it's not the normal part of an Easter service. Having a birdcage here, he, he said, let me tell you the story of it. Several days ago, I noticed a little boy in tattered and torn blue jeans and a dirty t-shirt, cap off to the side, whistling, walking down an alley, swinging his birdcage. Clinging to the bottom of the cage were little field sparrows, were little field sparrows that he had caught. So I stopped him and asked, say, Sonny, what do you have there? He said, oh, I've got some birds. What are you going to do with them, I asked. Oh, mess around with them, tease them, something like that. Well, I asked, when you get tired of them, what are you going to do? He thought for a moment and said, well, I got a couple cats at home, and they like birds. I think I'll just let them, let them uh, have it, have at them. Pastor said in his heart, pastor said his heart went out to the little bird. So he made the little lad an offer. How much do you want for the birds? Surprised, the boy said, Mister, these birds ain't no good. Well, the pastor said, regardless of how much you like, regardless of how much would you like for them, Little fellow said, how about two bucks? Good entrepreneur, huh? How about uh, uh, two bucks, he said. Sold. So he reached in his pocket and peeled off $2 bills. The boy shoved the birdcage forward, pleased with his, shrug of, with his uh, stroke of good fortune. When the boy left, the pastor walked a good distance away, lifted open the little cage door and said, shoo, shoo. And he shoved them out of the door and they flew away. Church, the empty birdcage was the perfect illustration of how Satan had the human race trapped and frightened. Jesus Christ, my friends, not only paid the price for our freedom, he has set us free. So again, I hope that story kind of put it into perspective, what this day means. Now, before I jump too far ahead, I want to pray. I forgot to do that in the beginning, but we, it's never too late. I want to pray for our pastors we're going to be reading, and then we're going to be opening up God's Word and read the resurrection account. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we are amazed at what you did for us. 
sending your son be born to live, to experience all the things that we experience, the good, the bad, the ugly, the beautiful. He suffered and died for us, to free us from sin and death. And then, Lord, he rose from the grave, proving who he truly is, your son, second person of the Trinity, the Godhead, God the Son. We believe this, we know this, Lord, and we do this because our faith tells us it's true. So now we know again that he's now sitting, your son is sitting at your right hand, waiting for that time and moment when he will come back for us. All his children, all your children, bring us home. So again, we are thankful for this wonderful, beautiful day, Lord, and, and just what you, what was accomplished or 2,000 years ago there in that tomb. So fill right now this place with your spirit, Lord, and, and speak powerfully to those that are here, those that are watching, so they may hear from you, so that lives may be changed and relationships restored and People will be strengthened, Lord. Use me as your vessel now. We pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. Now a lot of events occurred between last week and Today, I don't have really the time to get into all those stories, but again, it's those, everything is found between chapter 21 and the chapter that we're going to be covering today. And so, yeah, this was the climax of that story here. And again, here now, we'll read what happened the events that transpired on a dark Sunday morning over 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem. Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 1. The Word of God says, After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to view the tomb. There was a violent earthquake because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and approached the tomb. He rolled back the throne and was sitting on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards were so shaken by fear that they became like dead men. The angel told the woman, the women, don't be afraid because I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell the disciples, he has risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Listen, I have told you. So departing quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, they ran to tell his disciples the news. Just then Jesus met them and said, Greetings! He came up, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus told them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. Now, I want to dissect our text just a little bit, and I want to point out five noticeable aspects about Matthew's account of the resurrection. The first noticeable aspect about the story was that 
it was astonishing, completely astonishing. Before dawn on Sunday, as the two Marys were on their way to the tomb, Matthew tells us about the astonishing event that had occurred. There was a violent earthquake. Uh, for those of you who haven't been through an earthquake, a pretty sh shaky earthquake, this was one of those quakes that would have shook in anybody, shaken anybody, would have startled, scared anybody. It's probably one of those earthquakes that you might have seen on TV or on the news where the people inside buildings are just holding on to dear life. Everything is just falling everywhere. We have to remember again, this wasn't just a small little trembler. This was a violent earthquake. Again, now, this wasn't your typical kind of quake either. In a natural earthquake, two blocks of earth suddenly slip past one another or break apart from each other because of the tension caused by prolonged energy buildup. The cause of this particular earthquake and what made it so astonishing was this. An angel of the Lord descended from heaven. Again, astonishing. Anytime earthquakes have been used distinctively by God in the Bible is to highlight an important event. These biblical earthquakes have three main purposes, judgment, deliverance, and communication. Which one do you think this one, what was the purpose of this one? Which one do you think? Now this astonishing event didn't end there because we're told this angel approached the tomb, rolled back the stone, and just sat on it. Let me ask you, do you think the angel moved the stone so that Jesus could come out? Do you really think that's what the angel did? Do you think he rolled it? No. The stone was rolled away not to let Jesus out of the tomb, but to let the disciples look in and see that it was empty. The reason the angel was sitting on that stone was to tell the first people who would arrive there what had happened and what to do next. The second noticeable aspect about the story was it was shocking when the Roman soldiers were guarding, that were guarding Jesus' tomb, when they saw that pure brilliance flashing from this angel's face and the pure white garments that he wore, they got so shocked and scared that they completely passed out. Those goats, those fainting goats. <laughs> ah! And then, <laughs> that's what I... Picture in my head. Bible commentator Adam Clark correctly noted, God can, by one and the same means, comfort his servants and terrify his enemies. The resurrection of Christ is a subject of terror to the servants of sin and the subject of consolation to the sons of God because it's proof of the resurrection of both. The one to shame and everlasting contempt, the other to eternal glory and joy. What side are you on? Besides Jesus' transfiguration and Stephen, before he was martyred, there was another character whose face shone bright when he was in the presence of God's glory. You all know who it was? It was Moses. Exodus chapter 34, verse 29. 
as Moses descended from the mount, from Mount Sinai, with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, as he descended the mountains, he did not realize that the skin of his face shone as a result of his speaking with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face shone. They were afraid to come near him, but Moses called out to them. So Aaron and the leaders of the community returned to him, and Moses spoke to them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near, and he commanded them to do everything the Lord had told them on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever Moses went before the Lord to speak with him, he had removed the veil until he came out. After he came out, he came out, he would tell the Israelites what he had been commanded. And the Israelites would see that Moses' face was radiant. Then Moses would put a veil over his face again until he went to speak with the Lord. And so here's my point with this. If anybody, anybody ever tells you they had an actual physical encounter with God, they saw him face to face, take a good look at their face. Take a good look at their skin and see if it matches what it says here about those who have a direct encounter with God. Their entire body ought to be shining brighter than any light. Now the third noticeable aspect about the resurrection was that it was validated. After the angel calmed the fears of both women, he told them, he's not here. For he has risen, just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. In the resurrection accounts of Luke and Mark, it says that these women entered the tomb and saw that it was empty. So with their own eyes, these women were the first ones to validate that the physical body of Jesus, it wasn't in the tomb. It was no longer in the tomb. Now, what did they see in the tomb? According to John 20, the grave clothes lying on the stone shelf, still wrapped in the shape of Jesus' body, of the body of Jesus. Jesus basically had passed through the grave clothes and left them behind like an empty cocoon as evidence that he was still alive, that he was alive. There was no sign of struggle. The grave clothes weren't in disarray. They weren't dirty. They weren't stepped on. They were perfect. Even the napkin, which had been wrapped around his face, was folded carefully in place, in a place by itself. Again, it was validated. It was, these women saw it. And yeah, maybe there's, you know, again, the, the word of women wasn't taken, and it wasn't important, and a lot of people didn't, you know, society didn't see it as, as valid, but the apostles, the apostles trusted them. They believed them because they had served alongside of them with Jesus. So they knew that what they were saying was true. The fourth aspect about the resurrection was that it was confirmed with an encounter. Yes, these women had visual proof that Jesus wasn't in the tomb. But besides the testimony of the angel, they didn't have physical proof that he'd risen from the dead. Well, at least not until they began to run back to the disciples. Verse 9 says, Just then Jesus met them and said, Greetings. Hi. They came up, 
took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Friends, the resurrection of Jesus was now confirmed with visual, audible, and tangible encounter with Jesus Christ himself. The fifth and final aspect of Jesus' resurrection was that it was instructional. Twice in our story here, specific instructions had been given to the women about what they were to do and say to the other disciples. In verse 10, Jesus tell them, tells them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. Even after most of them had abandoned Jesus when he was arrested, and even after Peter had denied knowing him, Jesus still viewed him, viewed them as his brothers and wanted to see and be with him. What does that tell you about his heart, what kind of person he was? This is a great example for all of us who struggle to be around and love people we once cared for we once loved and have done something to wrong us. I know from personal experience that it's not easy. But if we truly desire to follow Jesus, we must make an effort. You must make an effort to do as he did. To follow him, be like him. As you can see, the resurrection of Jesus Christ was indeed glorious, remarkable, impressive, and extraordinary. It was also important. It was also important for, for these reasons. First, the resurrection is proof of God's immense power. You see, to believe in the resurrection is to believe in God. If God exists, and if he created the universe and has the power over it, then he has the power to raise the dead. If he doesn't have such power, then he isn't worthy of our faith and worship. Thus, In resurrecting Jesus from the grave, God reminds us of his absolute sovereignty over life and death. He is in control of life and death. He knows when a person will live, is born, and he knows and is in control when when someone dies. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is also important because it validates who Jesus claimed to be, namely the Son of God, the Messiah. According to 1 Corinthians 15, hundreds of people witnessed the resurrected Jesus, thus proving without a doubt that he is the Savior of the world. Another reason the resurrection of Jesus Christ is important is that it proves his sinless character, his sinless character and his divine nature. The scriptures said God's Holy One would never see corruption, and Jesus never saw corruption even after he died. It was on the basis of the resurrection of Christ that Paul preached this in Acts chapter 13. Through this man, Jesus, there is forgiveness for your sins. Everyone who believes in him is made right in God's sight, something the law of Moses could never do. Now that I've shared 
with you some of the important aspects of the resurrection story and the importance of Jesus' resurrection, I want to share with you a few reasons why it ought to mean everything to you. Why it ought to be more important than anything you have, you own, you love in this world. But what I decided to do was take the word risen from the traditional Easter greeting of he is risen and created an acronym to show you what a risen Jesus will offer those who believe and trust in him. If you're taking notes, I'll try to go slow, tell you what those words represent. First, the letter R in our acronym stands for restoration. A risen Jesus gives us hope of complete Complete restoration, not partial, not 20%, not 80, 90%, 99%, no, complete restoration. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 says, For we know that if a tent, that is our earthly home, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. If you're a believer, this means that the new bodies you'll have at the resurrection will be new, whole, and perfect. Amen, right? Amen. New, whole, perfect. This temporary tent that you live in me emphasize, is temporary. It's just a tent. It's not the mansion. It's the best way I can describe it. It's not what awaits you. What awaits you is something more beautiful, something more amazing, something that I think that words cannot even be able to describe. tent you live in will be restored into something far more glorious. The letter I, then, in our acronym, stands for inspiration. A risen Jesus gives inspiration. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18, Therefore, we do not give up. Even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. Let me read that part again. For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So we do not focus on what is seen, but what is unseen. What is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. See, church, you see, my brothers and sisters in Christ, regardless of what the world throws at you, believing in the resurrection will inspire you to live a life of obedience Because a better one awaits you. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, The essence of optimism is that it takes no account of the present, but it's the source of inspiration, of vitality and hope where others have resigned. It enables man to hold his head high, to claim the future for himself and not abandon it to his enemy. Letter S, then, next in our acronym, stands for security. A risen Jesus gives us security. Listen to what it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead 
will also bring your mortal bodies to life through His Spirit who lives in you. The question is, does His Spirit live in you? Notice that this is a conditional statement, meaning that if you have God's Spirit, then God will give life to your mortal bodies. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14, and 2 Corinthians clearly tells us that the Holy Spirit is God's down payment that secures the eternal inheritance He promised. And how is this security obtained? How can you receive it? placing your faith and trust in Jesus Christ by becoming born again. Putting your trust in Him. Letter E stands for excitement. A risen Jesus gives us excitement. It ought to give you excitement. I don't know about you, but the thought of being resurrected after I die excites me. It excites me, honestly. I'm not looking forward to death. I'm not saying that. But knowing, now knowing for a fact what's going to happen after I breathe my last breath, Excited. I'm going to live my life the best I possibly can. I'm going to live my life to serve others, to serve this church, to bring others to Christ. But when he's done and my race is over, I know that it's over. I'm not going to be like, oh, what about this, Lord? And what about that? Still, there was still so much I. I needed to do and wanted to do at the church and for the church. and No. That's it. He's going to say, okay, it's time. You're done. Come home. I'm going to give you something better, more glorious. I hope that's your mindset as well. Don't be scared of death if you're a believer. Something more beautiful awaits you. Revelation chapter 21 and 22, John gives us some description of what eternity will be like for believers. And there's one in particular, particular that I'm looking forward to. It's found in Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. No more crying, no more tears, no more pain. Gone. <coughs> Beautiful. I'm looking forward to it. It's just there is so much pain and hurt here in this world. People that have hurt me, people that I've hurt. It's all going to be gone. And the last letter of our acronym, N, stands for necessary. A risen Jesus was necessary. It was necessary because it gives us hope and proves to us the extent of God's love towards us wretched sinners. Wretched sinners like you and me. Paul wrote in Romans 14, 9, Christ died and returned to life for this, that he might be Lord over both the dead and the living. Friends, the resurrection of Jesus was also necessary because without it all, without it, all of us, all we would be doing is following a dead man who lived a good life and had good teachings. Sadly, there are a lot of religions that are doing this. 
today. They're following good men, lived a good life, and had good teachings. But they all died. And only, only Jesus resurrected. Nobody else did. And no other religion will claim that their prophet or guru or teacher rose from the dead. Again, I read this part of this passage earlier, but, this, but it's worth repeating. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 said this, For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you're still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more pitied than anyone in this world. But my friends, Jesus did rise. He did rise. And hundreds of people witnessed it. In his book, The Case for Christ, Lee Strobel wrote, I went to a, psycholog a psychologist friend and said, if 500 people claimed to see Jesus after he died, it was just a hallucination. He said, he said hallucinations are an individual event. If 500 people have the same hallucination, that's a bigger, bigger miracle than the resurrection. My friends, church, believer, the best days are yet to come. I read of a bright young girl of 15 who suddenly cast was cast upon a bed of suffering, completely paralyzed from one side and nearly blind. She heard the family doctor say to her parents as they stood by the bedside, she has seen her best days, poor child. No doctor, she exclaimed, my best days are yet to come when I shall see the king in his beauty. Is this the kind of outlook that you have today? Do you believe that your best days are yet to come? J.I. Packer said this, optimism is a wish without warrant. Christian hope is certainty guaranteed by God himself. Optimism reflects ignorance as to whether good things will, will ever actually come. Christian hope expresses knowledge that every day of his life and every moment beyond it, the believer can say with truth on the basis of God's own commitment that the best is yet to come. Because of the resurrection, because we have a risen king, the best is yet to come. So as I wrap it up, I'm going to just go over the main points that I just finished sharing with you. On the morning that Jesus rose from the dead, from the grave, his resurrection was astonishing, shocking, was validated and confirmed, and it was instructional. I also informed you how it was proof of God's immense power that it validated who Jesus claimed to be and how it proved his sinless and divine character, nature. Then, using the word risen, I told you how the resurrection of Jesus gives us restoration, inspiration, security, excitement, and that it was necessary. If you believe this and you know this, then great. Let's keep rejoicing. Let's keep going and let's 
continue to live this life knowing the best is yet to come. But I know there's probably some are watching and listening to this message and we want that hope. I'm sure there's many of you who have see the world around you and say, this is a sick and perverted world. And you've chased after things here and there and nothing has satisfied. There's that deep longing in you that nothing, no amount of alcohol, no amount of drug, no amount of weed, no amount of pornography, no amount of... Shopping can fail. I'm here to tell you that Jesus can fill that hole that you have in your heart. On this Resurrection Sunday, you have that opportunity. If you're listening and watching to this, watching this, friends. God is giving you right now an opportunity to come to the cross and receive his son. Have your son, your sins forgiven. All of them, past, present, and future. It doesn't matter how much you've screwed up, what you've done. You could have been a mass murderer. Who knows? You may be watching this from prison. I don't know. But Jesus is willing to forgive you. He wants to forgive you. You just have to come to the cross broken and empty, and he will fill you. He will restore you. He will inspire you. He will give you security. He will give you that excitement, that joy. He will give you new life. Don't let another Resurrection Sunday, another Easter Sunday pass without placing your trust in him. We're not guaranteed another one. The fact that I've made it another Easter is a blessing. The fact that all of you have made it here another Easter Sunday is a blessing. He has your life in the palm of his hand. And this might be the last opportunity he's given you. I don't want to guilt trip you. I don't want to make you feel bad. Again, this is a choice that you have to make. It's a choice that I made when I was at the end of my rope. And I'm glad that I made that choice to follow Jesus, to surrender, rededicate my life to him. So I want to invite you to the cross. If you want to be born again, so wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. And with all sincerity, with all your heart, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know and admit that I'm a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I'm sorry. I now truly believe that you died for my sins, that you died on the cross for my sins, that you rose from the dead three days later. I now repent. I turn from my sins and confess you as my one and only personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. And I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit. Fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me, teach me, and show me all about you for the rest of my life in my new born-again life. In your name, amen.
those of you who walked away from Jesus, no better day than to rededicate your life today. I know there's some of you out there that have walked away. I'll tell you this. I'll tell you what I knew. And what I, when I walked away and I was at that crossroads and at the end of my rope, I found that he was always there, not far from me, with arms extended, waiting for me to come back. And when I did, I felt his comfort and embrace. Not in the sense that, again, makes it sound all crazy and all that, you know, but I, I knew that embrace because I'd experienced and felt it before. He will do that for you. Just ask him to forgive you. Ask him, and he will. Thank you all for watching. Thank you for joining us if you're here watching us online. Pray you have a great Easter Sunday, and just rejoice again. He is risen, a Savior who's alive. See you next week. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.